Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This is our first one for 2021. Glad you all could join us today. Hope folks are doing well in the new year here. Got some good updates and a lot of demos to share today with the team from the team to share with you. So let's hop on in. Let's catch up on the latest Metasploit framework activity uh, with Alan walking us through a whole lot of good stuff. Alan, you want to take it away? Hey, yep. Um, so this demo will be covering Metasploit 6.0.21 to 6.0.27. So there's been uh, quite a few releases since the last demo. Um, to recap, there's been around 14 new modules, um, 14 or so enhancements, and about 18 bugs fixed. Uh, and by that, I mean separate pull requests that have been contributed either by uh, the community or uh, Metasploit developers from Rapid7. So jumping into the new modules, uh, community member NATO has contributed a Shodan host module, allowing users to uh, enumerate which ports are open on uh, publicly accessible hosts using Shodan's API. For this, I believe you do need a Shodan API, uh, API key, which you can get once you have created an account. Um, Team Sun CSR have contributed a new module for the uh, WP duplicator file read exploit, uh, which targets an unauthenticated arbitrary file read and vulnerable versions of the WordPress plugin duplicator. A uh, community member, Hootie, has contributed a new auxiliary scanner called WP Easy WP SMTP, which leverages a permissions related vulnerability in the Easy WP SMTP plugin, uh, whereby under certain conditions, uh, sorry, certain configurations, a password reset token can be acquired and used to access a target account. And community, community member, Hootie, has also contributed a new total upkeep WordPress plugin as well. Uh, our very own Christophe de la Ferrante has added a new module for the Spam Titan, uh, Spam Titan Unauthenticated RC module, which exploits an improper input sanitization in Spam Titan Gateway, uh, specifically versions 701, 702, 703, 707, uh, and that injects command directives into the command directives into the SNMP configuration file to, to achieve remote code execution. And we'll have a demo of this later. Uh, Community member Hootie has also um, contributed a new Pulse Secure GZIP RCA, and I believe uh, Spencer McIntyre uh, also helped contribute to that. And this adds a exploit for unauthenticated vulnerability within the Pulse Connect Secure Appliance to gain uh, remote code execution. We'll have a demo of this. And Spencer McIntyre uh, has also added an exploit for the Apache Structs framework, which when forced performs double evaluation of attributes values assigned to um, certain tags such as uh, ID, which can then be exploited to achieve remote code execution. Uh, community member Hoodie has also contributed a new module for um, AIT CSV import and export plugin as part of WordPress. We'll have a demo of this. Our very own Will Vu has contributed a new module for um, unauthenticated user um, access for Solaris Sun SSH service. So that's a PAM username buffer overflow. Uh, we'll have a demo of this later. And community member Cassandra has contributed a new module which launches a fake WinRM server and enables an attacker to elevate privileges to system user. Um, I believe this is part of the juicy potato um, hierarchy of exploits and we'll have a demo of this later. And community member Tim Wright has contributed a new module for the CV 2020 1054 uh, Dry Iconex LPE. Uh, and this vulnerability is related to an outbounds write within the Win32K, uh, which leads to an elevated session as the system user. Um, this module targets Windows 7 x86 Service Pack 1. Um, and I believe it may be patched in the most recent updates, but we'll have a, a demo of that later as well. And our very own Brendan Motors has contributed a new Microsoft Spooler local privilege escalation module to gain code execution as NT authority. We'll have a demo of this later. And 
our very own Grant Wilcox has also added a new module for uh, local privilege escalation as part of CV 2020 17 136, uh, which leverages an arbitrary file write vulnerability to gain local code execution as the network service account. Uh, and combining that with Meterpreter's get system command will actually give you access to um, system. And we'll have a demo of this later as well. Our very own Spencer McIntyre has also consolidated the post windows manage VSS module um, into a single module, which then you can use actions to uh, invoke the functionality of, which is pretty awesome. And community member B. Coles has made improvements to the Juva in sync privilege escalation module. We'll have a demo of this later. And as alluded to within the Metasploit Pro update, uh, our very own Matt Hagen has made improvements to the uh, operating system identification logic for SSH connections to Windows targets when using SIGWIN to provide SSH services. And community member Egypt has improved the Apache Solar RCE module to be platform independent, specifically by adding a new Java target. Our very own Spencer McIntyre has also consolidated um, two of our modules, specifically SOX 5 and SOX 4A. Uh, they're server modules and they're now accessible via a single module. Um, the other ones have been marked as deprecated um, and you'll be notified as such whenever you try to use the older ones. And Spencer has also improved the readability of interpreter error messages. Um, so previously, whenever an unexpected error occurred, uh, a command ID would be shown, which is the internal ID that we use to communicate with the interpreter, but now that's being converted back into a readable string. And our very own Brendan Waters has added a new commemorative Metasploit 2020 CTF banner. Um, so that's for all participants that achieved 100 or more points. Uh, and I believe we'll have a quick picture of that later. And uh, community member Geislin has improved the Linux shell bind TCP random port payload uh, to be smaller than it previously was, and it still retains all uh, functionality. Community member Summerskit has fixed a bug in the x86 Linux shell payloads uh, where the socket was not properly closed. It was previously not working. Uh, and our very own Dean Welsh has added a graceful fallback to the DB nmap command to request pseudo privileges when required. Previously, this just told the user you require pseudo privileges and it wasn't possible to do anything, uh, but now it'll prompt you for uh, pseudo access. Uh, Dean Welch has also improved the antivirus detection warning mechanism. Um, so that now occurs earlier in MSF console's startup phase. Uh, so it'll actually warn users sooner if we've detected that you've got antivirus running. Uh, this is specifically a problem whenever you've got um, payloads that are being deleted and you plan to use them and it can give cryptic errors. Uh, so that's a well welcomed improvement. Uh, community member Tim Wright has also made improvements to OCK payloads, uh, which were previously causing high CPU usage. Um, and Tim Wright has also improved the OSX reverse shell payload to correctly capture uh, standard error output. Previously, this was just being ignored. And a uh, community member, uh, Mr. Zombie, has fixed a bug within the OpenSMTPD mail from RCE exploit. Uh, specifically, this will now work on environments which are maybe more strict in their POSIX compliancy, um, specifically when calling the read command. Um, and finally, uh, community member Chris Higgins has fixed a bug with uh, Metasploit's TEM stamp console prompt support. Um, it wasn't quite shown in the right date format. Uh, and as a reminder, you can use set prompt percent sign T within the MSF console to actually show you the current timestamp, which can be useful for um, cross-referencing with your report when you executed certain commands. And as always, a uh, big thank you to the community. Uh, we really appreciate everyone who makes the sort of Metasploit framework uh, better through contributions to the project. So big thank you. And you can always check the Metasploit wrap up blog posts at blog.rabbit7.com. Um, so awesome. Let's jump into our many demos. So we'll have a quick demo from Shelby going through the import and export 
or CE. All right, yep, I'm ready. Okay, so yeah, uh, so this is an exploit module that was submitted by Hoodie and it targets the AIT CSV import export plugin. Uh, and, and basically what it does is it exploits an off, unauthenticated uh, file upload vulnerability. Um, and basically that's it. it. It doesn't do any sort of, uh, for the file handler, it doesn't do any sort of um, extension checking, any sort of file verification or anything like that. So you can simply upload a PHP shell uh, and get code execution uh, against basically WordPress via this plugin. And this is for versions uh, below 3.0.4, I believe. That's great, thanks. Next up, we've got Brendan. You will be going through the uh, printer daemon exploit. Sure. So this is uh, much like uh, CVE 2020-1048, uh, which was the original printer daemon. Uh, the original printer daemon uh, has a, the fix that was put in for that, check to make sure uh, that uh, you had access, but it only did so, actually, could you pause for just a second? Uh, thank you. Uh, but it, the, the check took place only when the virtual printer was created. So what wound up happening is there was a bypass that was released uh, where uh, you used a file junction and you created the printer pointing to a place that you would write to. Then you uh, added a file junction rerouting the file that you created the printer with to point to a trusted location, and it worked just fine. So you'll see that this is very similar to 1048, except it uses a file junction to be around the spot check that was there to fix 1048. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, and in this case, uh, I've just got a standard 64-bit uh, interpreter on a Windows 10 1903, I believe. This has the patch installed to prevent 1048. And you can see I've got nothing up my sleeve. Uh, in this case, there are a lot of options for this particular exploit that I'm going to switch because this is a particularly long running exploits, you have to reboot the machine twice. The first time you reboot the machine, you get the DLL file overwrite. Then the second time you reboot the machine, uh, the DLL is loaded by the spooler service itself. So you're running as system. So in this case, I've just set up the, uh, the payload. Getting the callback information. Uh, now, in this, normally this would not call back immediately. Uh, as you can see, disable payload handler here is already set to true. I'm actually going to set restart target to true, which will restart the, the target after we put down the, uh, the printer job. Uh, I'm switching the WFS delay because I want the listener to stay for a lot longer. Uh, I'm setting disable payload handler to false so that uh, this does go ahead and launch a handler because I'm just going to go and reboot this machine a couple of times to get the, uh, uh, the execution. Is uh. Is it beneficial for me to speed up the video at this point a little bit, or are you got? Uh, if you give it just a second, I'll hit run. If you want to, it'll go through this, then I'll just reboot the machine, uh, the VM a few times. Uh, if you want to go ahead and jump forward in that, you're more than welcome to. Uh, it shouldn't be too much longer, though. OK. I think uh, I rebooted the machine without logging in one time to show that sometimes you don't actually get the override immediately. So I think I rebooted this machine three times during this demo. One thing to remember about this particular uh, 
exploit is that there is the if the sound is turned on on the machine, a sound will kick in and there will be uh, a small notification icon in the bottom right hand corner that says a printer, a virtual printer was created uh, and it is in an error state. Good to know. It's all documented inside the documents, but uh, I this this one's a this is a pretty rough exploit as far as requirements and everything else, but it does give you system, which is very nice. <laughs> Actually, if you wanted to jump ahead, I'm not sure how much longer is in the video. Because I still have to reboot one more time. In there. Doesn't give me the preview. Uh, well, like so this reboot probably overwrote the DLL. And there we go. We get the callback after the, the next reboot. I realize I have to exit out of this. And we can hop to that session. And we're system. That's great. Thanks. Uh, next up, we've got Christoph, who will be demonstrating the Druva InSync privilege escalation module. Yep, sure. So, uh, Druva InSync client for Windows uh, exposes a network service on TCP port 6064 on the local network interface. So, uh, InSync version 6.6.3 and prior do not properly validate user supplied program path in the uh, RPC type five messages. So this allows uh, execution of arbitrary command system. And uh, it is actually a patch bypass. Uh, the previous uh, um, CVEs uh, has been patched and this exploit um, a, uh, it, it exploit a path traversal bypass uh, uh, from the first patch. So uh, please, uh, can you go ahead and uh, run the video, please? Thank you. So this is very straightforward. Um, we're going to set up a handler be, uh, to get a session. We're going to check that this session has no specific privileges. It's running on a Windows 10, and here we go. So no specific privileges, and we're going to run uh, the exploit. So it is a basic uh, path traversal. So you just um, include some common directly into the RPC message. We go setting some specifics and the session. We're good to go. Gonna check and run. There we go. We have system uh, on this uh, Windows 10. Awesome. Uh, I believe you've got another demo, Christoph, to do with the uh, drunk yeah. potato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, this is uh, the Bits service, which is the background intelligent transfer service. So this service is uh, usually use the idle bandwidth to transfer data. Um, this is used by mainly by Windows Update, Windows Defender, and Microsoft's instant messaging projects to transfer files. Uh, so it transfers files in the background when you're not actually using uh, bandwidth. 
So it appears that this service connects to the local uh, WinRM, which is the Windows Remote Management Server. It connects to uh, WinRM on port uh, 5985 TCP and tries to authenticate with NTLM every time it starts. So this exploit will simply launch, uh, it launches a fake WinRM server, then ask BitService to start and provide a valid NTLM authentication handshake to steal system token and escalate privilege. Um, so it's pretty nice uh, uh, logic here. So the, there's some restrictions. First, we uh, you need to have a session with some specific privileges, uh, either in-person name privilege or assigned primary token name privilege. We're going to check this uh, on the video. And uh, also, it only works on systems that don't have WinRM server already started, because this exploit actually start a server, a fake server on the same port. So you cannot have uh, this server running already. Um, note that most of the Windows servers have WinRM running by default. So most of the Windows server won't be vulnerable uh, by default. Finally, we uh, the Windows 7 uh, version seems to be not vulnerable. Apparently, the bits service doesn't attempt to connect to WinRAM server on this version. So I uh, can go ahead and, and play the video. Thank you. <clears throat> so we're gonna we're going to uh, uh, set up the uh, parameters for this exploit. Uh, this is uh, a 64-bit Windows, so we're going to use the corresponding payload, setting the local host and the local port. Right. Um, okay, so. From here, we need a session. So we're going to set up the handler and uh, with the same payload. Here we go. Yeah, a different port because this one is already taken. All right. And run the payload on the Windows machine. So, no, we need to run the payload first. There we go. So we have a session where, and we're going to check the privileges because, as I said, we need some specific privileges, uh, at least one of uh, between uh, impersonate uh, privilege and assigned primary token name. So here we have impersonate privilege with this session. So we're good to go. Some verbos and last check, everything okay. I'm gonna run it. All right. So first, as we can see, the module will check if bits and WinRM are stopped, and then it will start the WinRM server and ask bits to start also. Here we go. System. That's great. Not really a question, but I'm looking forward to the next variation of Potato. I'm wondering what they'll come up with as a name next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and finally, we have an additional uh, module from yourself, Christoph, the spam yeah. Titan unauthenticated mm -hmm. RCE. All right. So, uh, spam Titan gateway from Titan HQ is an anti spam appliance and protects against unwanted emails and malwares. Um, so this module exploits, uh, exploits uh, an improper input san sanitization, sorry, uh, in version set.1.2.3 and.7, um, and was discovered by Felipe Molina. 
So this exploit injects a command, uh, some command uh, into the SNMP configuration file and get remote code execution as a root. Note that this is an, unauthent an authenticated exploit, but only version set.03 needs authentication. Um, so all the other vulnerable version are, uh, you don't need authentication to exploit this. Um, so please, can you go ahead and read the video? Yep, thank you. So uh, how it works. First, it will send an HTTP POST request to the SNMP dash x dot php page with an snmp common uh, directives passed to the community parameter so it will use the extend command which uh, extend plus command which execute the command when you trigger it with the proper snmp request so the application will simply add this uh, directive to the snmpd.conf file. Uh, so that's handy because you just need to uh, query the SNMP server with the correct OID to trigger the payload. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward and, and, and powerful. So here we're running the check method, which is just checking if the proper page, vulnerable page is uh, uh, available. Note that I uh, enabled uh, HTTP trace to look into the exploit uh, uh, more uh, in detail. So here you go, we got, we got a session. This is a common shell, but the exploit also supports uh, a binary, so you can have a metaprise session. I forgot to demo the metaprise session actually. Um, all right, so the TCP trace, so it's gonna first check the SNMP page. Uh, web page and then request and upload the payload using this post request. So here you have some parameter and the community parameter uh, actually um, contains all the payloads. I'm going to copy this and uh, decode the, it is URL encoded, so I'm going to decode this to have a better understanding of what's going on. All right, so here we go. We have the comedy string with the IP and the extend command with the payload. So uh, it's when you query the SNMP server with a proper OID that will trigger this command. And that's it. That's really nice. That's a great walkthrough, thanks. Next up is Spencer McIntyre, who will be giving us a demo of the Pulse Secure VPN GSIP RC module. All right, I uh, wanna go ahead and uh, play the video. Uh, this is a uh, remote code execution of vulnerability in the Pulse Secure uh, VPN appliance. Uh, now it is an authenticated uh, vulnerability. You have to have, uh, I believe it is administrative access to the UI for uh, Pulse Secure, but then it allows you to execute code in the context of root uh, by leveraging a vulnerability in uh, the way that it handles uh, gzip files that can be used to overwrite uh, the contents of a uh, particular page. So that's what we're, Doing here, the uh, the check method is going to go ahead and make sure that you can uh, log in and validate that the vulnerable version uh, is present. And then after that, it's going to use uh, the vulnerability to upload a gzip backup file that's going to overwrite a component of that set cookie.cgi page that uh, when requested with the header that we specify, which is that random value over there, is going to go ahead and trigger code execution which we then use to execute our command payload. And then there we can see that we have a interpreter session opened as root. And uh, it took a few seconds uh, to run there. Um, and that's because of how the, uh, the stager go ahead and functions. Uh, but otherwise the vulnerability is pretty reliable. Uh, so I worked on this module in uh, conjunction with a community contributor, Hoodie. So I wanna give him a big shout out and thank you for uh, the original implementation of this. I believe uh, Will Vu also provided some guidance on it. Nice team effort, sounds like. That's awesome. 
Uh, and we've got an additional demo from yourself, Spencer, with the Oracle Solaris Sun SSH PAM buffer overflow module, which is awesome. Yep. Uh, so this module was uh, was written by Will Vu. Uh, the vulnerability was discovered by uh, external researchers, and it is a buffer overflow in the parse username function of the PAM library on Oracle's uh, Solaris. Uh, so this vulnerability, uh, if you want to go ahead and run it, uh, the check method is going to do a version check on the SSH fingerprint uh, that the service returns to go ahead and make sure that it's going to be targeting a, a Solaris system that appears to be vulnerable. Uh, now this vulnerability is unauthenticated, so we don't need to have a username and password or anything like that because of where the vulnerability is, the buffer overflow when it's actually validating the username parameter, we of course don't need to have any kind of uh, authentication in this case. Uh, so we can see that our target server is vulnerable and then we can go ahead and exploit it and we go ahead and we get a command shell running as root and then we can interact uh, with this Solaris system. So that one was a, it was a little bit quicker uh, execution on that one because of the, the memory corruption nature of uh, how the vulnerability is triggered. All right, so today we're gonna to be looking at the CV2020-17136 card filter. Um, this was a vulnerability in the CLD built.sys, which resulted in an elevation of privilege on Windows 10 version 1803 and later. So let me just go here. You'll basically see what I have here is a uh, basic uh, interpreter shell. Um, just showing you that I've got the R host and L port set and set up, and now we're running as a normal user. So if we query the system info, you can see it's a Windows 10 machine, and you can see the build number there as well. And we're just going to go ahead and open up a command prompt, um, double check that the win version is correct. So you can see it's a 20H2 uh, build. It's on the latest build as of November. Um, so this is prior to the December 2020 updates, which is when this vulnerability was actually patched. So now we're just gonna try a get system here. So the get system is basically showing that as a normal user, we can't just elevate to system normally. We have to actually, um, use an exploit to get the admin to the system. Um, also not running as an admin, because as I've shown there, the name pipe impersonation, so all of those admin options uh, do not elevate us to system, which would be the case if we were, like, they would succeed if we were running in an elevated admin session. So I'm just going to go ahead and set up these options here, so on. Um, and then just adjust the L host and L port just uh, to show that it's not an existing session Go I have. And we're going to set it to run on the current session that I've got. Um, and you can see that as part of our exploit, we'll do an order check. So we'll see if the target's vulnerable. It will report that a, it appears to be a vulnerable version of Windows 10 20H2. We'll then go ahead and drop the payload um, and onto the target and inject it into a running copy of Notepad. Um, we'll then read the output once it starts running the exploit and you can see that we've got a new session as the network service. From the network service, we can then use the name Python impersonation RPC SS variant um, or technique four of get system to elevate our privileges to system. Um, so I'm just going to verify that these system privileges are correct. So you can see if we load the Kiwi, um, we're running as system and we get all of the credentials successfully. Um, so from here, I'm just going to background this and I can show you we've got both the session as a normal user and the session as the system user. So that's that for them. Uh, the next fix that we had was a quick fix for the run command tab completion. Um, previously, this command was crashing. So as you can see here, um, I'm running the latest version of the framework at the time of recording that, um, this video. And just 
going ahead and showing that this is the latest version. Um, and basically what was happening when, was, was when people were trying to run um, tab completion using the run command for a module, um, most boy would basically just crash. So as you can see here, if we now tab the option, sorry, tab on the run command, we actually get a whole bunch of different options. And if we type in some more text, um, you'll see we're still able to tab on that as well. So the issue has since been fixed. Users can now or, uh, tab to order complete the run commands, whereas previously it would crash. And finally, we've got a demo of the CV 2020-1054 draw icon EX LPE. Uh, this was a LPE in Windows 7 uh, prior to the I believe it was the March 2020 updates. Um, oops, amazing. Uh, so we're just going to demonstrate that here. So you can see I've already got a interpreter session on a Windows 7 system, and this is just running as a normal user. So just going through all of that to show that it is a normal session running as a normal user. Um, we're not running as an admin or anything special. And we're just going to verify privileges. You can see this is the privileges of a normal user. Um, and we'll, we can further verify this by running get system. So if we background this session, then we're going to try use the this, uh, local privilege elevation exploit. So we're just going to type it in there. I make a small typo here, so just got to fix that up. Yeah, so we'll use the CV 2020-1054. And we'll just set up the options here. How to use the existing session. And then run. This will also include an order check, which checks to see if the target is vulnerable to the exploit or not prior to launching the exploit. We'll then launch Notepad and inject the exploit into it. And as you can see, we're now running this system. We can further verify this via Kiwi. So we're just going to load Kiwi and then run the creds all command to dump the creds. You can see that works successfully. And it also says that we're running this system. So that's another way of verifying it. And finally, if we just background this session and list our sessions, you can see we're both running as, we've got one session as a normal user and another session as system to further confirm that this is correct. And if we look at the host details, we can see they're the same host that's being targeted. So all is good on that one. And that's it. Awesome. Uh, and then Brendan's going to give us a, a quick view of the CTF banner, which was added to uh, the Mesoid framework, I believe. Um, so this is the capture the flag uh, for the 2020. Uh, we had a earlier this year, it seems like, uh, or early, late last year. Wow. Uh, we had a capture the flag and uh, we went ahead and added all of the team names uh, for anybody that got uh, 100 or above. Uh, there was one team name that is left out here, but that was due to uh, some censorship issues for, for the language. But otherwise, everybody's here. Nice. That looks awesome. Can't wait for the 2021 uh, commemorative banner as well, Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Let's see. Thank you, Alan, for taking us through all that awesome content. And thanks to everybody for the demos. Um, those are fantastic. Rounding out our updates today, um, I'm going to demo uh, some things for the attacker KB or the attacker knowledge base, hacker data at community scale. Uh, what I'll show you, uh, kind of, you know, just off the cuff name, clickable things, watched things, and more. So uh, clickable things, um, the, the, everything I'm demoing today is up on production, uh, so it should be accessible to everybody. Um, we've, uh, the team has made some changes to make these items up here, user interaction, privileges acquired, and attack vector uh, clickable so that you say, oh yeah, I'm looking at the, the bad neighbor or ping of death, Redux, uh, uh, Vuln, 
and I want to see, see, I see that it's an adjacent network type of attack vector, and I want to see other things that are adjacent network attack vectors, I can just click it. And by clicking it, it'll bring up uh, other, other topics that have that same uh, attack vector. So that's kind of a cool way to navigate around. Uh, again, that works for values, these, these three values up here, attack vector, privileges required, and user interaction. Uh, another thing, so that was clickable things, uh, watched things is another item that the team added recently. Uh, so you can see here now there's a watched topics tab in your profile, makes it really easy for you to go see what are all the things I'm watching. Uh, and it gives you a list of those there um, to make it make it really simple to say, yep, these are the topics I'm watching. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you could stop watching it if you decide you're, you're not you're no longer interested in it. And I would expect that this should, uh, if I refresh my screen here, that uh, my watch topics does drop to four because I unwatched the topic and it had been five. So just a nice, easy way to, to, to if you have, you just want to like catch up on the topics you're watching, you can click into your profile and get them all right there. Um, and the, the end more piece of this, uh, if we go back to just the, the attacker KB landing page, uh, the team added a really cool section at the bottom of topic pages. So we'll go back to our like bad neighbor uh, example since we'd already been there before. And as you scroll down uh, through the page, you have the usual information around the topic. Uh, but you'll notice, you know, once you get past the assessments and, and the associated comments, uh, that at the bottom you get a nice little section of uh, more from the Attacker KB community, uh, other pieces of information assessments that um, uh, have been added to attacker KB that uh, can give you, uh, you know, is suggested to, you know, if you want to click in and learn more about, you know, hey, what was Grant's write up on the on CV 2021-3007, and um, you, you can access those just by clicking any of the, the slugs there, and it will take you uh, directly to the associated uh, assessment. So just a nice way to help uh, kind of, you know, to hopefully uh, engage more folks with you know other interesting pieces of information um, that, that may be useful to them. Excellent.